Uh, we're here today, May 3rd, 2013, at the Institute for Policy Studies to interview uh, Tina Hobson, a Washington, D.C. peace and justice activist for many years. Uh, Tina, as an activist and forward-thinking federal employee for many years, has a, a, a impressive record in her own right, but at uh, her request today we're going to concentrate on uh, her uh, husband uh, the last uh, 10 years of his life, uh, Julius Hobson, who died in 1977. Uh, Hobson, more than any other uh, D.C. civil rights activist, changed the face <clears throat> of highly segregated uh, Washington, D.C. in the 1960s. And before starting uh, the questioning, just a little background on Julius. Uh, he was born in a highly segregated Birmingham, Alabama, so as a young person he experienced uh, uh, racial discrimination at, a, at an early age. Uh, his mother was a high school principal. His father ran a drugstore and cleaning plant. And Julius, after Army service in World War II, in which he uh, flew some 35 sorties and won three bronze stars, uh, came to D.C. after stopping off in back in Alabama and in uh, New York uh, as part of his studies. And he had, here in D.C. He attended Howard University in the late 1940s, received a master's degree in economics. Uh, so, uh, and then for 25 years or so, he had uh, various positions uh, in federal agencies here. But it was, of course, in the civil rights arena that Hobson uh, brought about major changes in the 1960s. Just some examples among many. As president of the D.C. chapter of the Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE, from 1960 to 64, Hobson ran more than 80 picket lines on some 120 downtown real retail stores that discriminated in their uh, refusal to hire African-American employees. And this resulted out during that time period in the employment of some 5,000 black citizens uh, and in some of the best known stores at the time, Woodward and Lothrop Heck Company, uh, et cetera, uh, which hired their first black clerks because of this uh, pressure. And because of his pressure and uh, pressure from CORE, uh, first uh, black bus drivers, public utility employees, auto salesperson, so many other uh, uh, areas, uh, too, that became uh, racially uh, integrated. Uh, one other uh, major thing among many, after a series of live-ins organized and directed by CORE in private apartment buildings owned by real estate giants such as K. Fritz and Calamiras, Hobson called for a march on the district building, and uh, some 4,500 people turned out and put pressure on the appointed uh, governing body of the time, the D.C. commissioners, and they enacted a housing organ ordinance desegregating all rental housing uh, in D.C. Uh, so many other things, uh, the hospitals, uh, uh, schools of accounting. Uh, he was a uh, key figure in the successful anti-freeway fight of the late 60s and 70s. Uh, he perhaps most famously, uh, Hobson initiated and won the historic Hobson v. Hansen lawsuit, which ended the racially biased track system in D.C. Uh, public schools and also outlawed uh, teacher racial segregation, differential expenditures per pupil, etc. Uh, he was a founder of the uh, D.C. Statehood Party and was one of the few significant black leaders to take a, a visible role in the anti-Vietnam War uh, movement and in 1972 ran as the presidential, uh, sorry, vice presidential candidate on the People's Party ticket headed by famed baby doctor Benjamin Spock. As I said, these are only a few of the things uh, that led Sam Smith, a local uh, progressive journalist, to write that he was as important to Washington in his way as Martin Luther King and Malcolm X were to the nation. So finally, after that long introduction, uh, Tina, I want to uh, get to uh, you uh, and uh, tell us where you uh, uh, grew up. Uh, where you were born, grew up, and how you happened to come to Washington, and then, of course, how you happened to meet uh, Julius Hobson. Well, that's uh, a very interesting adventure. I actually was born in Seattle. My father was a naval officer, so we traveled a lot. In fact, I was four years old in China, uh, and uh, we moved every two years, so I was used to the changes. And um, I graduated from Stanford University in 1951 and uh, went through the Coral Foundation internship in public affairs in uh, the next year in San Francisco. So I was very interested in government and um, eventually my marriage uh, resulted in a divorce. I had two boys at the time and um, so 
I elected to, uh, President Kennedy had just been elected and said, everybody come, you know, everybody come and let's fix this forever. So I was one of those who uh, thought that this was a good idea and that uh, I could deal with my children and with the help of m and support of my family. So I came back to Washington, D.C. in uh, 19, let's see, 62. But I didn't meet Julius until 1967 because then uh, a classmate of mine at Stanford had gotten a Ford Foundation grant, uh, which was uh, the National Institute of Public Affairs. And we were to train people from cities around the country, and there were 12 each, like the disciples that would come from the cities. And you were working for who at that point? National Institute of Public Affairs, okay. which was the Ford Foundation. Yes. Yeah. And um, my job was to bring in people to talk to these people, and there was a lot of racial tension, et cetera. So I brought it, I identified, somebody said Julius Hobson. So we brought him in to speak to the groups of 12 representing three cities each. Uh, and they were the police chief and the head of the board of super, it was like Atlanta, they were big cities. And uh, every time Julius would be ranked the best speaker. <laughs> and he, he had just won the Hobson v. Hansen case. And a lot of the people there had never even thought about it and went back to their own cities to take a look at their own school systems to see what was happening. So that's where I first ran into Julius and it was a uh, surprise that uh, he was uh, just consistently ranked the top speaker, even though we had heads of department speaking. I was going to uh, say, you, I think, uh, said you first uh, heard him on the radio. Oh, so, yes. Yes. And that, but what, tell us about that. Yeah. Well, I was living in Arlington, and so I drove across the bridge every day. And so one day I was driving across the bridge, and there was an interviewer interviewing this man named Julius Hobson, which is one of the reasons I eventually invited him to speak. Uh, and uh, they said, isn't it wonderful that we now have a city council? Instead of three people representing uh, the district, we now have an appointed council, Walter Washington, and so forth. And isn't that great progress, Mr. Hobson? And what he said was, um, well, he said, instead of having three people not represent me, I now have 11. <laughs> And I never, never appreciated the appointed city council after that. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're right. That's the, I heard about him. I also tracked the Hobson v. Hansen case. You couldn't avoid it. It was in the newspapers and uh, a lot. And uh, that was one of the things, of course, he came to talk about. So um, when uh, in the Hobson v. Hansen case, at, at when the final decision came down from the Court of Appeals, I guess it was. Yeah. Uh, w w were you already seeing Julius at uh, in whatever that was, 68? Uh, well, actually, yeah. Actually, I met him in 67, and we were mar uh, we were married in, uh, he was elected to the Board of Education in 68, and we were married in 69. Right. And uh, he was elected uh, to the Board of Education and then ran a little educational program for a while and one of the books that he, he wrote a series of books and also was funded to say this is the damn children and he wrote a series of, of how do you deal with your school system more effectively and fairly and um, the other thing that he did was he wanted to make sure that he, the decision was implemented, so he was given money by a foundation to monitor the implementation. Mm -hmm. Now, he, um, as I understand it, uh, although this was the justice was done in that case, but he received little thanks for it. Is that uh, your recollection? Uh, yeah. <laughs> My recollection is that everybody was furious when he won the case. Obviously the superintendent was, but so were the teachers. And because they had this track system that was pretty, and the blackest kids were in the lowest tracks that could not get to college, had no way of taking the courses to get to college. So those black teachers were, so those teachers of those kids were mad because he was changing the system. 
Uh, the uh, board, uh, so everybody was mad. He only got one phone call, and that was from Sterling Tucker. Mm -hmm. And Sterling mm -hmm. Tucker called and congratulated him on winning the case. Mm -hmm. But as time went on and we understood what that meant, mm -hmm. and how that broke apart such a rigid system that just alienated so many kids, I think uh, gradually he, um, you know, we all benefited from it. Yeah, because there was, as you said, the lower track, and then there was one that was college bound, and there was an honors track or something. Uh, uh, yeah, and and well, and there was the the uh, the top students were able to go to specific schools, so there was segregation in the schools. Some schools were better than other schools because they were given more money by wealthier parents, mm -hmm. and that was equalized. So the parents didn't like it, mm -hmm. you know, because they just couldn't give their money to the school where their child went. Mm -hmm. So it was a very significant uh, and long fought, um, and there were a lot of people who did a lot of, of good work on that case, and I think it was, uh, but it was a riveting case. And Julius was obviously a good spokesperson for that case. But, um, and I need to tell you the story because you brought it up in your introduction. I had a person working for me at the Civil Service Commission where I did work for two years as part of my government career. And um, she uh, told me that the thing that was most important to her about Julius is I did not realize that children in the hospital were segregated by race, babies, when they were born. So the black babies were over here and the white babies were over here. Um, and her name was O.C. Hall, I, I believe, and she, she had a master's degree. I don't have a master's degree, and she worked for me. And she said, you know, when your husband went into that hospital and went up to a white ward, got in bed and declared himself sick and would not leave, and there were a whole bunch of newspaper people and photographers in the lobby, she said, that's the thing that mattered more to me than anything else he did. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was very impressive. Right, oh, that's, that's terrific. Uh, when you, um, uh, you got married in 69, and I believe you though, announced your engagement under unique uh, circumstances, and did people know you and you were seeing each other? Because it was a time when uh, rising black nationalism, there weren't that many interracial couples at the time. Well, with Julius, unfortunately, everybody knew me because he insisted on taking me everywhere he went, including to black churches when he was running for, uh, for uh, the school board and for the council, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he would, uh, he would insist that I go and I would say, well, I could stay in iron, you know, I need to do some homework and stuff because I knew it wasn't going to get him any votes and he said he didn't care, they could vote for him or not. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I was always there, uh, or except when I could manage excuses. And um, in, in fact, one time at the Civil Service Commission, I think I told you this story, uh, I walked into the commission, it was full of guards. There were guards in the basement, there were people on the roof, there were, they wouldn't let anybody out and so forth. And there's a park across the street from the Civil Service Commission, which is now OMB. And um, I called Julius on the phone, we weren't married at the time, and I said, what's going on here? Why are all these guards? Oh, he said, uh, there was another person, and I can't remember, who was supposed to have a protest in that park, but he's always late. <laughs> And uh, I'll maybe think of it in the middle of the night, but, um, he, it, I, uh, but he was supposed to come over and have a little protest with five people sort of thing. And this was, I mean, the fortress. I, it was Civil Service Commission Fortress. He said, I, bet, I guess I better come over, you know, so we don't disappoint the public. So he actually brought people over and conducted a very nice protest in front of the Civil Service Commission all because I called and said all these guards are here and we're not allowed to leave. And uh, that gave me a new sense. That's why after Julius died, when I was with the um, uh, Department of Energy and the Secretary of Energy went up to Boston and there was a big protest outside and I was there with him, I took him out into the protest 
and he made the headlines of the Boston paper. Mm -hmm. Because this fear, this constant fear of other people, I soon got over living with Julius. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You just don't, mm -hmm. you know. So that was one of my experiences. What you, you had mentioned about I could stay home and iron, and you also told me some uh, interesting and funny uh, things. Well, not first of all, on your first date, and then, uh, and then what he said to you after you were married about the... the oh, house. yes, that's embarrassing. <laughs> uh, he, um, our first date, he invited me over for dinner, to his apartment for dinner. And he was a perfect gentleman, and he didn't believe in dashiki, so he always dressed uh, like he walked out of a bandbox. But anyway, he invited me over for dinner. He was an uh, excellent cook and escorted me home and was very gentlemanly and so forth. And um, he said uh, at that particular time, I want you to marry me. He said, now you'll have to think about it. And I thought, he, because he said, I want you to know my intentions are honest. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was very appropriate. We weren't married for another year or so. But, um, but he did, uh, when we were married, he liked to cook and he didn't drink. So I would have a glass of wine coming home from work and he would cook dinner during the week. I cooked dinner on the weekend. This, wasn't a, this was a partnership. But uh, after we had been married a little while, he asked me if it was okay if he cleaned the house because he said, you're not as neat as I am. And uh, he ironed his shirts every day because his mother had taught him how and he didn't like the way they were folded by the laundry, you know. So he would get up on Saturday morning and he literally would clean the house and keep things picked up. Uh, although I did my share too, but uh, not, but it was, I mean, it was amazing. I never knew he had those skills before we were married, and he obviously was taught well by his mother, and he was, and he had a lot of energy. Julius could get up in the morning and look at the newspaper and figure out an agenda for the day, as well as his full-time work at the, uh, um, at HEW at the time, and, um, but uh, uh, so those were, and also, you see, all during this time he loved opera because when he was in the military, he went uh, up or down the boot of Italy and uh, where other um, soldiers went to bars when they had time off, he went to an opera mm -hmm. because he didn't drink. And the, he said he didn't drink because he said if I drank, I'd drink too much. Mm -hmm and because I'm excessive in things and uh, in commitments. And um, I only got him, the only time that I got him to drink was a rum sweet drink, which he enjoyed. But other than that, he just had no interest. And he did smoke a pipe. That was yes. not perfect, but that was okay. Yeah, he was, uh, he was always dressed uh, to what kind of has a fedora, I guess. A uh, yeah, a re regular, and, yeah. Uh, and always a suit and, and the, tie, even amidst the most uh, the cheeky clad or scruffy right. war people. Or right, whatever. Yeah. No, he always uh, uh, paid attention to the fact, he said, I don't want the clothes to take people's attention away from what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. The other thing that was, he used to say is, I can tell you everything I know in 10 minutes. So he never spoke more than 10 minutes, mm -hmm. but it was the questions that people asked that brought out a lot of the good things that he had to say. Mm -hmm. The, um, b back, uh, when you did uh, announce that you were uh, oh, engaged, yeah. right. and, and uh, I think you said that happened at a... Yes, oh, that was a critical time because uh, he had been, a, a, he was first elected official in the District of Columbia because he was elected, he was elected to the school board outright, whereas the others had to run again for specific positions. And then the next time he decided he'd run from a war, for a ward instead of at large. And he, uh, because he dragged me around to all the churches and everywhere, um, I think that's one reason he did not get elected uh, at that time. So when um, it was announced that he had lost the election, I thought, what do we do here to take the, the focus away from his losing? So we announced our engagement. So I announced it to the press. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, that was when we were officially engaged. So then I got to the Civil Service Commission the next day and I was in charge of the whole program to eliminate discrimination against women. And I wasn't talked to for four days in the elevator because they did not know. I mean, you know, I didn't, I was just normal with Julius. I mean, and Julius and I were, wherever we went, we went and, and but I, you know, I didn't, he picked me up at work sometimes, but uh, there wasn't an occasion for him to come in. So at the Civil Service Commission, they didn't know. And since I was in charge uh, and director of the Federal Women's Program at that time, and he was charging discrimination on the Hill mm -hmm. against minorities, uh, I was called in and told that uh, that I really uh, that I was kind of I illegally now in my position, and they were going to have to think about it. That it was illegal me for me to hold a position where he was then doing exactly the the opposite outside. So uh, I went to Julius and I said, "How do I handle this?" because nobody is talking to me and so forth. He said, go back and ask them what law they're talking about. So I did. I went back to the um, senior person and I said, I just would like to know what law, oh, and Julia said, and then tell them that you'll consider a better job. So ask them what law they're talking about and if they won't, don't want you in that job, they could give you a better job. So that's exactly what happened. And uh, I think it's why suffragettes learned so much from, uh, from you know, uh, minorities, from African Americans getting the vote, um, these men. But uh, in any event, um, I did. I went back and I said, what law? And there was no law, obviously. And they did give me a, bit, and a more interesting job. I mean, a better job. It wasn't more interesting because I loved the job I had but it was a, a, a new training program for hiring and training minimally skilled people in the federal government, and I was in charge of that job. You, you mentioned uh, when we talked a couple of weeks ago uh, that uh, Julius, until he met you, had one blind spot uh, as far as social justice was concerned. Oh, yes. yes. That was, he did not understand that there was any discrimination against women mm -hmm. because his mother was a principal, of a high school, which is as high as you could go, and certainly in Birmingham, Alabama. Mm -hmm. And he said, and you graduated from Stanford, you know, and you could graduate from any place you wanted to. And I said, no, I said, Stanford Law School limits women to 7% at that time. Uh, and Jewish people, I think, were lim limited also. So uh, I said, no, and so I began to talk to him about discrimination against women little by little. In fact, one time I got so mad I kicked the bathroom door, uh, you know, because I just, he just couldn't get it through his head that there was any discrimination in this area. But uh, gradually it seeped in and he saw commonalities and he was very helpful in whatever I was doing. I, uh, in 1969, then he filed a lawsuit, Hobson v. Hampton, I guess which alleged discrimination against African-Americans, Mexican-Americans, and women. That's right. So I guess he was getting the message. He got the message. Yes, uh -huh. he got the message. And he was, and furthermore, he was interested in the message. He just hadn't thought of it that way because mm -hmm. in the black community at that time, the men were held back and out of sight, so particularly in southern states, so that they wouldn't be um, identified with a crime or lynched, in essence, and so women had more of an opportunity. Um, so he didn't he didn't see the overall picture, but when he did, he did. The um, uh, uh, moving uh, back just for a minute on, on your marriage, and you had two children. Julius from a previous marriage, he was of course divorced, had two children. Was uh, was that? Uh, hard for them to come to terms with your marriage or was it not an issue? And then more specifically, some of the black militant activists at the time, did they, how did they react? I think probably we were more acceptable to the white community than to the black community. And um, for instance, one uh, black secretary that 
I knew. She said, you know, we're just angry that you married him because he's special to us and we wanted him to be remain in our community instead of bridging other communities. Um, I think that uh, his children had a greater problem than my children. My two adult sons, I lost uh, one child. Um, one child died before he was four, but the other two that Julius knew really respected and liked him and marched in every peace march that Julius walked in and um, uh, were very supportive of him. He went to their graduation from Pomfret. Uh, he, um, we went on vacations to um, the islands, one vacation to Ber Bermuda. And uh, so I think that we were more acceptable to the white community than to the black community. I didn't think so at the time, but I think so. I grew to think so. What, what was uh, the issues you worked on with Julius during that period of uh, when you were married and both the uh, uh, any, anything relating to uh, the anti-war, education, yeah. uh, civil rights? What, uh, well, we were married in 1969, right. and he ran for vice president, as you pointed out. Uh, and here's a picture of him with Tom Hayden. This is, uh, yeah, during 